like to start off reading a poem called Heaven to Heaven. And this poem was inspired, as many of my poems are, by famous people who I admire. This particular poem was uh, inspired by John Muir. Now, I don't know if everybody knows who he was. I know some of you probably do. But for those who don't, John Muir was uh, lived from 1838 to 1914. He was an American naturalist, author, and an early advocate for the preservation of wilderness in the United States. He left the Sierra Nevada Mountains of California and helped to save the Yosemite Valley, Sequoia National Park, and other wilderness areas. So we get right to the quote. The quote was, and where could one find a more glorious place to die? And this is with his reply to his wife, who was concerned about his safety on his trips alone to the mountains. You're right, John. If a man's last view of this world is of the moon above Half Dome, or a cluster of stars crawling around the beam, if his final drink is from cupped hands full of cold creek water, if the final fading sound in his ears is a song of the dipper, that lively sprite of a bird that so delighted you, if his last breath is of the sweet scent of a ponderosa pine, what better way to exit one heaven and enter the next? Next uh, is the poem about my father, and it's a situation we're all familiar with uh, during a winter storm when the power goes out. Called My Father Telling Stories by Lion Light. Why is fall somewhere from the weight of too much snow and ice and darkness becomes complete? A flashlight search brings back candles and kerosene lamps whose wicks are lit and bring a dim light back to the living room. My father sits telling tall tales about six foot snowdrifts down Maine when he was a boy. The sparkle in his eyes becoming the brightest light in the room. Here's another poem that concerns mountains. Mountains are one of my favorite places to visit, so I quite a bit about them. This is called As the Sun Disappears in the Mountains. I grab my camera and start walking. I hurry down to desert, more deserted for the day by the tourist traffic. The only sound besides my footsteps is the rushing current of the river beyond the roadside trees. I want to capture that last coil of light spreading its bloody splendor across the peaks before its final flame fades and sinks into the night. Here's another one about my father, because it's a, kind of a sad one. It's called, uh, waiting in ICU. Inside these concrete walls, in this antiseptic room, it's where they have brought a man to die. Covered with cables that connect him to machines that only prolong his misery, my father lies still in the numbered room without a window, a tube thrust down his throat. A man unable to speak, so used to telling stories. A man grown so weak, so used to the hard labor of shovel and hoe. The end comes late one night, and word comes that the only life support that mattered is beaten, battered heart, and beat his last straight beat in silence. And here's a poem, subject matter is something we've all heard about the blue stories in recent years. Listening to coyotes howl late at night, a chill enters my blood and spreads through my body. I can hear the pack out back hunting on the old railroad track. I think of the fly news of attacks on neighbors' dogs and cats. They'll prowl the backyards of the neighborhood until dawn sends them back to their den, where they will wait for the light of the full moon and return to hunt once again. And here's still another poem about mountains. <laughs> I did tell us one of the last one, I think another one here somewhere. Where peace always greets me. I pity those with no love for the mountains, whose heart is never moved by the sight of a snow covered peak or a deep green forest of pine. Who would be to whom time spent sitting for hours by a mountain creek with his time wasted? Who would be bored walking along trail into the woods, 
unexcited by the calls of unseen birds, by the sight of deer feeding in a meadow filled with wildflowers, or the distant music of a spring-fed waterfall. I leave them behind in their cities of concrete and noise, for the long drive of a hundred miles in the climb of 5,000 feet into the clouds to the cabin where peace always greets me. Here's one, it's a funny title. This is Camping Out with Dumpster Duck. Uh, 30 years ago, 1979, I was hitchhiking out in Northern California. I just left Berkeley. And I wasn't used to camping out. I had to pack, but I didn't have any tent. So I was on uh, Highway 101, just as the sun was going down. And I said, well, I'm just going to have to go back to those woods and going to have to uh, just pick up my sleeping bag and make camp. I've been too thrilled about it. And so this pickup truck pulled up, and this young kid got out. He had a cowboy hat on, had a pack, had a guitar spun over his shoulder. He said, what are you up to? I said, well, I'm going to go back into those woods, I said, to, to camp out. But I got no, I just have a no sleeping bag. I don't have any tent. He said, well, I got a tent. So we went back, and he made, well, he made one of them why he was called Dunkin' the Duck. Well, this would be a little offensive to some of you, but he, he's sort of like a hobo, although, although he's only 25, 26 years old, and he, he'd been on the road quite a bit and tramping around, and he said, well, what I do is when the grocery stores throw out their day-old stuff, I go out and search for it. I said, oh, well, okay, that's fine with you, but I'll go to a market basket <laughs> So this is a story of uh, us building a can. Uh, camping out with dumpster duck. We built our fire, we built our fire on the ground where an old teepee had once stood. Supper was hobo biscuits made of flour and water and black coffee, boiled to the brim of an old tin can, hanging on a wire high over the flames. His face in light and shadow, his guitar full of melody, his voice full of emotion, he sang songs he wrote about the women he had loved. Dimming to the faint glow of dying embers, the fire slowly went out, and we crawled into the tent and spent the time until sleep took us to dreams, swapping quotes from the Bible, while out and above us, a sky full of stars gave testament to the fact that light is always there, even in darkness. And there's a one humorous, it's called uh, called The Beauty of Frog Music. Spring arrives and voices rise near the meadow. The peepers are at it again. The nightly chorus of courting carries through the dark on the night air to my open bedroom window. The beauty of frog music enchants the spring night. Listen, young ladies, with voices like those, there must be a friend of mine now. Here's one that was inspired by a visit to Mark to the Wildlife Refuge. Waiting for deer at the island refuge. Standing in the viewing tower at dusk, I noticed two of them slip out from among the reeds into the open road. Staying close by her mother's side, the fawn plods and then trots along, like an eager child led up to play. Slowly crossing to the other side, they vanish back into the reeds, almost as one. Driving out of the refuge after dark, I spot another doe standing alone by the side of the road, lifting her head to look toward me. Her dark eyes are suddenly lit by the glow from the first light of the rising moon that climbs above the dunes. Here's one I wrote for one of my heroes, uh, Bob Dylan. He recently celebrated his 70th birthday, so inspired to write this. Bob Dylan on his 70th birthday. From the beginning, you created your own myth. You became the man of many masks, the mystic poet, the jack of hearts, minstrel of the blues, prophet of doom, preacher of truth, conscience of a nation. You are the trickster of legend and fable who broke the rules of society to show us the true reality. You are the shaman who travels to other worlds of the imagination bring back the ancient truths and reveal them to us in poetry and song. You sing for the outcast, the stargazer, the dreamer of the lovers, the rebel. You are the voice of those who have none. Go on into the twilight. Go on as you have always done, refusing to believe in anyone or anything, 
the wisdom of your own heart. This point is another mountain call. <laughs> the dream was of a cabin. The dream was of a cabin hidden high in the mountains near a clear rocky stream whose music was sweetest after the spring snow had melted and filled it with melody. Dawn brought the song of a bluebird from a distant meadow, red with blooming paintbrush. As I woke to stoke the stove with pine to warm the room and scent the cabin air. I left early for the trail that led up the mountain where I watched the sunrise to baptize the world with holy light once more. Here is a poem about what I did many summers as a kid, going down the tracks uh, to pick blueberries. And it's called uh, Searching for Summer Gold. We were a bucket for grade of four, entering the oven heat of a late July morning in search of the place they said was loaded with berries. Our arms spread with off to keep the mosquitoes away. We walked the trackless path of the old train track, taken up years ago, past patches of wild pink roses humming with hovering honeybees. A sudden scare of the deer bolted from the brush behind us, our hearts racing as fast as he fled. Our pails full, the faint rumble of thunder hurried our feet home, where our mothers waited to turn our hard labor to the sweet rewards of dumplings, cakes, and pies. This is called For My Coat of Many Colors. For my coat of many colors, I'll take the tint of blue from the autumn sky, the yellow of the full harvest moon, the green of sunlit moss, the brown of newly turned earth. Give me the deep purple of a martin's wings, the deepest shade of sunset red. Stitch them together with a silkworm's whitest thread. Here's the last one, and uh, this is a humorous one. Uh, where I lived at my family's home on Ruby Street in Byfield, we had a barn in the backyard, and in that barn we had a uh, dirt cellar, and we kept some pigs there, four or five pigs. Mm -hmm. Well, one day as a kid, I remember those pigs escaped on the street of Byfields, and uh, I was coming home from school, and somebody said to me, you missing any pigs? I said, not that I know of. Well, we think you are. They said, they're up running on Main Street. So this is one of that. It's called The Day of the Pig's Invasion. It was Liberation Day for Pig Nation. They ran wild in their Main Street invasion. <coughs> Nothing could stop the fury of their indignation. They had broken free, much to our consternation. Those runaway pork chops could not be caught. Those hams on the hook could not be stopped. For hours and hours, they eluded the cops. When they made a stop to eat our tomato crop, my mother tried in vain to scare them with a walk. <laughs> On Main Street, they caused a major traffic jam. But those brazen hams didn't seem to give a damn. <laughs> they ignored shouts of, get out of the way, you spam. <laughs> They were fearless and couldn't be scared to scram. It seems that nothing could stop those hams on the lamb. Nothing was off limits to those marauding swine. They knocked down my mother's clothesline. They knocked down my neighbor's grapevine. All over town, they ran through every stop sign. But when the sun started to set in the sky, they bid their day of freedom goodbye. And all at once, they all to its home did fly, back to our barn in their beds in their lowly sty. Thank you.